CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Good evening, everybody. My name is David Morgan. I am Arlington's environmental, environmental planner and conservation agent. The April 18th, 2024 public meeting of the Arlington Conservation Commission will be conducted in a remote format consistent with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, which extended remote participation in public meetings until the 31st of March 2025. Please note that this meeting is being recorded, and I will put a link in the chat now to where you can find all of the materials for tonight's meeting. Chuck Taroni is our commission chair. He'll facilitate tonight's meeting. Please note that there will be a public comment period for each hearing. Each vote taken during the meeting will be conducted via roll call vote, and we begin with roll call attendance. So Chuck, to you for attendance. Sure. Uh, Commissioners uh, Brian McBride. I'm here. And David Kaplan. Present. Susan Chapnick. Here. David White. Here. And Chuck Taroni's here. Um, you forgot so, Mike. Yeah, Mike. And Mike Gildas game. Oh, thought you weren't here at the. I'm game. here too. Sorry, Mike Gildas game is here. And associate members Eileen Coleman. I think she was going to be absent, Chuck. Sure, she, and Ireland. Then Sarah Alfaro Franco. Uh, present. All right, so I'll just review the agenda. So we we'll start out with administrative review of the minutes, and then. Just mentioned the correspondence and where to get that. And our discussion items tonight are Mount Gilboa feasibility study, invasive removal at Mount uh, McLennan. <clears throat> Water Bodies Working Group will uh, update us. So will the Tree Committee and the CPA Committee, along with the Artificial Turf Committee, uh, will discuss the final report. And then we have an, a request for an amendment, and that's from uh, 869 Mass Ave, which is the Arlington High School permit. And our hearings are an extension permit, and that will be extended. So the extension permit for the high school is going to be extended. Uh, it's requested by the applicant, and then we'll get into 88 Coolidge, which we haven't heard from them in a long time. So 88 Coolidge will get us up to date on their application. So that's the agenda. And with that, let's turn right to the minutes, David. All right, I will share my screen. We have minutes from way back to review. These are from September 21st of last year. Um, these were done by our office manager in the planning department. She did a fantastic job. So there are very few edits. Susan and Nathaniel went over them from their personal notes and added a few things. Um, um David, uh, that first one, um, where there's the question. Yeah. Mark, I said, just take out that se sentence. You don't need it. Just take out the whole sentence and just say D. Morgan or authorize the project to move forward. I don't think it's necessary if we don't remember what was said or we couldn't figure it out. <clears throat> and this, uh, Susan, you had a question here too about the votes on the RDS. Yeah, it, it seems like. Something got messed up there, and the, I don't know if it was the recording or the interpretation of the recording, but we didn't do three votes. We just did one vote to close the hearing, which I found missing. Oh, so I that's see. what I added in. And then we did a vote to issue a negative determination with conditions. So, so and there were two of those. There was one to issue a negative determination and another to issue the RDA, <laughs> which not what we did. So I just wanted to clean that up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, this date. And the date should be 2024. I checked that in my notes, too. 
Very good. We had Thorndike Place on way back then as well, so there were a few comments here. And I will say that Jennifer did an excellent job of transcribing everything, especially for Thorndike Place, which is important for the record to have it all in the minutes correctly. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, she's done a fantastic job. So Nathaniel added here, as has been his custom recently to act with his consent, which was taken, and the um, fact that he didn't participate in the RDA hearing. I believe that's about it. Great. Do you want to do these as a slate or individually? It's up to you. If you tell me a slate, we'll do it as a slate. If you say individually, we'll do this one now. Do it as a slate. Great. There's even fewer edits. This is from October 5th. So it was the meeting following the one we just reviewed. And I have one additional edit just because I was curious. Um, I looked up the dragonfly, which is on page two, that was mentioned as endangered, and it's not a spotted bog haunter. It's actually a ringed bog haunter. So we, we could just correct that. So on page two on the bottom um, of the page, I see page one. Yeah. Okay. Are you so, following me? Yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe. Uh, so I don't see, I don't think you switched to the October one, David. Yeah. At least I'm uh, not seeing it. I see September yeah. 21st at the top. Yeah. I apologize. That's I was okay. Word, so I figured it would follow me to the next one, but I was back. Oh, it's never that easy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if you go down there, oh, somebody changed it already. Yeah. I was you just, did. Good for you. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah. There it is. Because I was just curious what the endangered species was, so I looked it up, and it's very rare, in and it's only found in New England, in New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts when it's found. So that that was interesting to me. But other than that, I didn't have any other edits other than the ones I recommended. Is it bog haunter or bog hunter? It's haunter. I thought that oh. was a typo also, but it's not. It's H A U N T E R. Oh. So that is correct. Yeah. And the rest I don't know my dragonflies that well. Okay. So we went through that. Is there another one, David? No, these two. Okay. So we have September 21st, 2023 and October 5th, 2023. Could I get a motion from a commissioner to approve those two sets of minutes? So moved. Second? Second. Um, Brian McBride. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Michael Gildesgame. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. Look, we got it. Uh, moving right along, we have uh, correspondence, and all correspondence is available to the public for a full list. Um, contact the conservation agent, and he'll be putting his. Um, email address or the email address in the chat in a few minutes. And our first discussion item, moving down to item number two, our discussion item is the Mount Gilboa Feasibility Study. Who do we have here tonight who's going to talk about that? That would be our consultant with the lion. Oh, hi. Hey, uh, could you please introduce yourself for yes. the record and uh, bring us up to date with this uh, feasibility study? Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Martha Lyon. I'm um, a landscape architect, and I've been managing this project since the end of last year. Um, I have a team that's working with me. I'll go over them when I um, give the PowerPoint presentation, but um, I'm delighted to be here tonight to just bring you up to date. The last time we 
saw you as a group was uh, December 21st, and a lot's happened since then. So I want to share with you everything that's going on. Um, I'm going to share my screen. David, may I do that? So Martha, before you get started, yeah. how long would are you expected to need for this PowerPoint presentation? Um, David asked me to keep it to 10 minutes, and mm -hmm. then if you would like to ask questions, I believe there's some time for that as well. Sure. Okay. So about there's 10, a or, lot of 10 or 15 minutes. Sure. Yeah. There's a lot of materials. I'm going to be as very brief as I possibly can be. And I'm happy to follow up with any questions or answer any Great. of your questions. And, I and can I just, you will share this information with the, con the PowerPoint with the Conservation Commission so we could post it or look at it again later. Yes. David Thank actually you. has a copy of it. So, so let's you. just hold our questions until after the presentation so we can get started. Thank you. Yeah, I know you have a lot on your agenda. I totally get it. Let's see here. Whoops. Um, okay. There we go. All right. Well, again, thank you. This is a project update. As I mentioned, the last time we saw you was uh, in De the very end of December. And I will bring up to date on where we are. If my screen, oops, okay. Um, just to remind everybody the purpose of the project, which I can sure you all remember, but just to keep us all updated, um, was to assess community visions for Mount Guboa, focused one on the understanding of desirable uses for the structures on the top of the hill, and also uh, focusing on enhancing the property's ecological and conservation value. And again, here are the participants. Um, you know who David is our uh, honcho represented from the town. You are all here listed as our real clients. And then my team is myself, Daphne Politis, who is managing the public engagement portion of the project. She actually is in Greece right now, so she wasn't able to attend, but weighed in on um, this presentation. Uh, John Watney, structural engineer, who's going to be assessing the house uh, momentarily. And then Wendy Frontiero, who assisted me with the update of the inventory form for the Lester Hayden House and Garage. This is the process. Um, it's essentially four parts, and we are kind of at the conclusion of the second part and midway through the third. Um, so what I'm gonna be focusing on tonight is not only updating on community um, engagement, which is on the right of this um, flowchart, but also the assessment, uh, which we um, have been working on over the last couple of months. And at the end of the presentation, I'll give you an update on the timeline because I'm sure you're curious about that. So just to remind everybody, this is Mount Gilboa. It's 10.2 acres, it's eight parcels. And there is a 1.795 par acre parcel that is uh, inside my cursor that holds the house and garage. The orange on this was the original uh, Lester Hayden Holdings, um, but the parcel with the house and garage is 1.75 acres of that. Uh, just to give you an update, you probably recall, but I just wanted to go through this again. Um, in the fall, we concentrated on working a lot with the Crescent Hill neighbors and the residents of Arlington. Um, we held a, a site walk and a couple of interactive forums, and then also accepted a lot of email messages from individuals. Um, there was a long Mount Goboa Crescent Hill neighborhood email thread. And we also accepted six word stories. All of these are compiled in a summary of engagement, which is um, on the Conservation Commission website. And again, just briefly what the key takeaways were from those uh, events last at the end of last year. Um, there's a lot of interest and passion for keeping the wooded area of Mount Coboa as conservation uh, area, meaning as natural as possible. Interest in, in maintaining the property as a shared neighborhood open space resource. And also um, there was concern about Mel Malky Bowie turning into a park rather than uh, serving as a reserve for wildlife and wildlife habitat. And then regarding the house, um, 
the um, participants in the events really did understand the historic nature of the house and its contributions to Arlington history and saw those as important. Mm, but there was concern that if it was a private residence, it would become unwelcoming to the public or make Mount Goboa unlike unwelcoming to the public. Um, using it as a public amenity, there was concern about increased traffic and parking in the neighborhood, which is very dense and with narrow streets and most of them are dead end. Concern that the, a public amenity at the house would be a disturbance to nature. And then of course, the cost of um, updating and maintaining the house would be a financial burden to the taxpayers of Arlington. We also conducted an online survey and that took place in the first couple of weeks of January. Uh, it, we had 187 respondents. And these are just some of the general um, uh, pieces of information we were able to abstract from this. Uh, the survey is compiled. And again, that is on the Malcabo page of the Conservation Commission's website. But these are just some in general uh, responses. The favorite, and these were the things that were, were rated the highest in the survey. So favorite features would be the quiet and peacefulness, the tree canopy, the presence of animal habitat. Least favorite features were the growth of invasive plant species, uh, presence of dogs and their waste and then trash. Uh, preferences for improvements included uh, providing greater legal protection, removing the trash and creating a Friends of Mount Goboa um, group that could perform stewardship activities associated with the property. And preferences for future use of the buildings included removing the house and garage, exploring options for reuse, <clears throat> and then selling the buildings was seen as least desirable. Um, and then we did ask the, um, the survey participants what their greatest concerns were about the future. And these were, a lot of the responses were similar to what we learned in our forums in the, at the end of the uh, 2003, 23. Um, one that improvements would end up turning the property um, from a wilderness area into more of a park, a public park. Uh, that changes to the house and the garage would impact the wooded area and encouraging expanded public use would increase the traffic and parking in the, um, as I mentioned, densely um, built out neighborhood. So that was some um, dealing, engaging the public. We also spent some time in the uh, first couple of months of this year talking to some of the entities that are we would call stakeholders, meaning boards and commissions um, and others that have a connection to Mount Gobo and would be potentially likely involved in uh, the future of what happens with the property. So the first was the Historic District Commission and Historical Commission. Um, Nathaniel Stevens and I made a presentation to uh, the Historic District Commission in January. And we were giving them an overview of the project, but I wanted to kind of get a sense from them, you know, where they stood on the property. And they um, they basically said that they really couldn't rule without um, what's called a certificate of appropriateness application. They, that's what the Historic Districts Commission does. It issues certificates of appropriateness for changes to buildings within the districts. Um, but it, it was confirmed that they would be the entity if this house were to be altered or removed, they would be the entity that would be in charge of that, reviewing that. The Historical Commission obviously is concerned about the building because they are the keeper of the inventory of the town, um, but they would be serving more as an advisory, um, an advisory role to the Historic Districts Commission. Um, and that said, on the right of this slide is the updated building form, the B form. Um, there was one done many, many years ago, and I think I have mentioned that the Massachusetts Historical Commission has um, recently upgraded their standards for these forms. And so um, my colleague, Wendy Frontiera prepared a, an updated form, which is quite detailed 
And I think really gives you some great insight into the value of this property. Um, and I also prepare, prepared a landscape form, an inventory form to accompany this. It's called a form H. Um, I had a meeting with um, the town manager, um, the deputy, and also the facilities director in Arlington back in March. And it was a very interesting meeting focused mostly on the house. Um, and essentially the major takeaways from that is that I think that the town, and I say the town, meaning the facilities department and the manage, the town manager's office, they, um, they really feel that they lack the capacity to act as responsible landlords to this building. Um, in the time that they did rent it, it was very difficult then for them to respond um, promptly to any problems with the property. And then of course, uh, along with that is just the cost of upkeep of this um, property. Not only the house, but also the grounds, the driveway. Um, it's a long, twisty driveway, and it's very expensive to plow it. And that's a town would be something that's something the town had to assume the cost of. Um, so again, owning the property, continuing to own the property um, is and a great expense to the town and they don't, these officials do not feel um, or believe that enough rental income could be ex, um, expected from leasing this property to cover the cost of even just basic maintenance, um, not to mention any kind of long-term and major um, capital improvements. And um, I also met with a real estate professional uh, on the same day, just to get a, a general sense of, was the house rentable? Um, could it possibly be sold? What were sort of the, um, the possibilities with that? And again, it was a much longer discussion, but um, the rental on this, um, there aren't a lot of homes of the size of in, for rent in Arlington. Um, and even if we're to rent for what a standard, say, four bedroom house would rent for, which would be about five thousand a month, the sixty thousand dollars wouldn't come close to um, even be able beginning to address what some of the issues are uh, to upgrade this property and also to maintain it. Um, but then, on the other hand, um, the uh, realtor did believe that this house was highly marketable. Um, even without a lot of upgrades to it, um, basically because of its historic character and also its location. So um, we talked about some scenarios for how that could possibly happen. The house could get sold um, either just as buildings or if the property were subdivided, there's a number of scenarios that are possible in that regard. And um, so I just I, I just want to say all of this is summarized in a, um, a, a summary document that I've provided to David. I don't know, David, whether you've passed that on to the commissioners, but you will we'll be getting it and it will be part of obviously the uh, feasibility study report. Um, we also looked at the regulations, all the regulations that affect this property currently and its future. Its future. Again, this is quite lengthy and complicated, but I tried to distill this down to a few main points. Um, as everyone knows, this the entire property, 10.2 acres, eight, eight, eight parcels is zoned as open space. However, the 1.795 acres with the house in the garage is exempted. That is sort of the new term for what we used to call grandfathering uh, from open space land use restrictions. And open space, the open space, uh, district restrictions really uh, limit use to recreational activities. Uh, as you all know, as I mentioned, his, um, the house and garage are contributing resources to the Mount Gilboa Crescent Hill Local Historic District. And as I mentioned, the Historic District Commission would need to review any um, alterations or removals associated with the property buildings. And um, and you all know that you have your own regulations associated with the properties that you oversee. And um, the uh, property itself um, would fall under your purview and that limits use um, to passive recreation. 
And then finally, um, from a re regulatory point of view is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And there are a number of issues associated um, with this and um, features of the property that are what we would say are non-code compliant or do not comply with the guidelines of the ADA. Um, not only the house, but also the trailheads and the trails themselves. So if this is something that the town is wanting to see um, improved at the property, um, there will be you know, quite a significant amount of work to get, get it up to uh, guideline standards. So we are now working on the landscape and building assessments. Um, these are the items that we're gonna be looking at. We are, I should say, I already have looked at all of the landscape, the buildings, uh, it are in progress. And then our next steps um, will be to complete those two assessments, prepare some recommendations, and then finalize the report. And we are aiming to um, finish by the end of June. And that uh, is it for my presentation. I'm, I know it was very brief, and as I said, there was a lot of detail in this that I didn't go into, but I'm happy to answer any questions if I can. Sure. Uh, thank you, Martha. That was, uh, that was nice, and as you said, it was brief, and I expect that there would be a larger, um, larger presentation in the future when all the components of that study is over. So I just want to start out by letting the commission and anyone here is to talk about this, that we have uh, many things on the agenda tonight and a lot of people are gonna talk. So I'm gonna entertain a few questions, but this is not the spot for um, a bunch of questions from all the commissioners. So David White, I see that you have your hand up. I like to see this area as much a natural space as possible. Martha, could you take down the slide if it's possible? It's just that we can't yeah. see who's uh, raising their hand. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to see all of Mount Kaboa as much a natural space as possible. In fact, I think the house and the garage should just be removed and the place restored to how it was before they were built. That's my recommendation. That's the most accessible and most natural thing to do. It also avoids all the overhead costs maintaining property. So that's my perspective on it. Any other questions? Um, yeah, Hitchcock, I'll, I'll just yeah. second what David said. And, and one question for Martha, maybe, what are the regulations on ADA compliance for hiking trails? It seems there may be some, uh, I don't know, uh, lack of clarity in my mind, I think, between, between like a trail that goes around the res reservoir, which is obviously ADA compliant and crushed stone, and then a hiking trail in the woods. And are we, as stewards, required to meet uh, that and a true ADA um, path. I, I, my understanding of it is, in some ways, that is up to you if, whether you want to um, try to make this entire property ADA compliant, um, which would be very difficult. Um, the federal government actually has designed standards for forest trails, forest service um, has standards, and that is the uh, set of standards that the town accessibility coordinator adheres to as well. Um, they are more lenient than, um, you know, a, re a, a recreation field or a public park um, because, you know, trails in the woods tend to be steeper. Um, they're not as wide. Um, the footing on them is uneven. So I think that there are a number of things you could do. One would be to um, look at a way of trying to make part of it. ADA compliant, you know, maybe you have a section of it that allows universal use that brings everybody to a viewing spot or something like that. And then the rest of it, um, you try to sort of minimally adhere to the guidelines as best you can. Um, one of the ways to try to accomplish greater accessibility is just to, to provide more information to users at the trailhead. So letting people know how long the trails are, letting them know what the gradients are, um, letting them know if there are places to sit. Those are all things that would, you know, just improve access. So it can be achieved in a number of ways without, you know, plowing down the grades and 
uh, blasting out the rock to create, create everything, you know, at a grade of less than 5%, which I wouldn't recommend that you do. Thank also, you. at the reservoir, the path around the beach berm is not accessible. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, so for people that are listening tonight, you can use the reactions button and the raise hand function if you would like to raise your hand to ask a question. Seeing none, uh, Martha, thank you for the presentation. Um, don't know when the next time, do you know when you'll come back to the commission with your final report? Or is that uh, to be determined? Yeah, I would, um, David, you'll have to remind me if we discuss this uh, final, I know we will be coming back to you. Um, maybe is it, I, I can't remember if we said it, we discussed a date or not, but it would be at one of your regular meetings. And um, yeah, and so I think we were thinking of June, I think, as I recall, at one of your regular meetings in June. I would have to go and look at my notes though. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll get an update in the future. And uh, I appreciate that. So we're going to... I have my hands raised. Oh, well, sure. Uh, just uh, introduce yourself. For the... I don't see your hand, but uh, introduce yourself oh. for the record. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Lori Leahy. I'm in Prison 21, right down the street from Mount Gilboa. I'm a town meeting member. Um, I had a question about it's unclear to me because there's so many stakeholders. Who, who is making the final decisions on what will happen? Like who has the final say? It seems like there's a lot of possibilities, but um, it's unclear about who will decide, I guess, that's the question. Is that for Martha or is that for the commission? Um, I guess that would be for David Morgan perhaps or the commission, whoever feels I mean, that's, that just speaks to how unclear it is about who's in, who's in charge of it. Sure, David, do you, do you have any answers uh, for, for that? Sure. It's Conservation Commission owned property. And so the commission has final say about what happens there. They'd be the ones to bring any proposal based on the feasibility study forward for funding. So there would be numerous steps between they're advancing any proposals to getting funding. Usually that's a public process, i.e. through CPA. And that also goes to town meeting, of course. So there are a number of stakeholders who would be involved in moving the proposal forward, whatever results from the study and whatever recommendations the commission chooses to accept and or act on. Okay, and that would include the house as well? It would, yeah, it's okay. also a commission property. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, so uh, we'll hear from people of Mount Gilboa Feasibility Study in the future. And we're gonna move on to our next item on the agenda, uh, which is invasive removal at McClellan Park. Is someone here to speak about that? Yes. Hi, oh, Eileen Crowder. Crowder. Sure, Eileen. Just, uh, just. I guess we all heard your name, but uh, state your name and address for the uh, for the record, please. Yes, uh, Elaine Crowder with the uh, Invasives Army, um, Glenbrook Lane, Arlington. Great. Um, yeah, I I am bringing forward uh, sort of a, a second update uh, for the area at McLennan Park. This is the second winter that we've done work there. Um, I do ha have a um, report that I had sent to the commission through David. Um, and it just has uh, some before and after pictures, which I thought you might find interesting. Basically, the areas that we are doing working on are very heavily bittersweet uh, invaded. And uh, also multi-floor rows. So this first picture is the before and after of multi-floor rows. Um, on the left is the before, and on the right is the after. 
Um, if, and if you move down a little bit, I, I'll show you the areas in the park that we've been focusing on. Number one was last winter's area of focus. And this past winter we've done, we did areas two, three, four, and five, with five being uh, the one that we did most recently. Um, so number two has, oops, yeah, keep it up there a little bit. Um, that area in number two has not only a multi-floor rose, buckthorn, which we didn't really uh, address, and two monster honey focused, if, if anyone's interested. <laughs> they have very, very long um, uh, thorns on it. <laughs> um, and we've got we've done a good bit of the cutting of vines in the areas three and four. And uh, now you can continue down and we'll just take a look at some of the things that that we're able to do. We, we've been piling um, in conjunction with Kevin Naughton, who is the DPW um, uh, parks person. Um, we he, he was happy to uh, for us to leave it in piles and then he came through and um, and shipped. He arranged for chipping to, to uh, take place for, for the woody material that was repla uh, uh, removed. Most of it was bittersweet cutting. Some of it was euonymus, a couple of uh, about three euonymus bushes that were apparently planted, and uh, a fair amount of um, multiflora rose as well. So as we go through, just you know, comment about. Black cherry being great. This is what an area in, along Huntington, uh, the path going toward Huntington uh, Street or Road, I'm not sure which. Um, uh, a red maple on the left was being very heavily invaded with heavy vines up in it. And these this area with a tree and in use also very heavily invaded. And we'll see the, the after picture a little bit later. Ah, oh, this is the euonymus uh, that we also cut. We did not try to get the roots out of these plants. We cut it back. Um, and here's the area that was with that red maple and the and the yews. Don't know whether these are native yews or not. If anyone knows about yews, I would be happy to learn. But <laughs> I don't, but they are yews. Um, okay. So, and just some fast pictures of, of some monster vines that we saw in the last area, which is closer to the wetlands, closer to the area that, that has standing water and, um, and Phragmites. Um, so we, we cut these, made windows, cut in windows uh, to, to uh, remove the uh, berry produ production up in the tree. And this is this is our prize. It was a about a seven inch um, vine, approximately thirty five years old. So the the thing that I'm actually bringing today is uh, we, trying to figure out how to replace all of the berries that have been reduced that uh, in from the vines that we've been cutting, um, and increasing some of the biodiversity in in here in this area. Um, so actually this is an, uh, a slightly older, uh, I had the opportunity to put in an order for some, some bare root plants. I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, if you didn't see, it's a very cost effective way to get some plant material in there. Um, what I had, I, I picked out some selection of, uh, elderberry, dogwood, two different kinds of dogwood, nanny berry and aronia berry, uh, to try to give some, um, uh, variety in the, uh, plant material and the types of insects that might be, and birds that, that can be supported with this material. Of course, since it's small, it's not going to be replacing the berries immediately. Um, 
but the idea is to uh, is to begin to replace some of this in the wetland resource areas um, using the slit method of um, of plantings that that is minimally um, that it has it leaves a minimal impact as you plant. Um, and then the one thing that I might want to have some help on, some ideas, is um, uh, the question of protecting these for a bit until they get established a little bit bigger. Um, I did, in, in what I sent to David, I, I put in some information about uh, the um, uh, sleeves the, that, that are protective tubings that might be uh, used. I don't know where to source it in this area. I found a source in Oregon, which would have a fairly expensive um, shipping cost. But the one thing about that particular supplier is it a lot, they don't require a bulk. So that's, the, so the, the cost of the plant material itself is under $50. Um, and it would double, maybe triple, depending on whether um, the uh, the material needs to be shipped for the for the tubes. So um, that's that's my request, uh, and I'm interested in what your ideas are. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I actually don't know where to get those tubes, but I think maybe someone on the commission may. I see Susan Chapnick has her hand up. Oh, actually, David had his hand up first, so I'll let him go and then I'll go. <laughs> David Morgan. Thanks, Susan. I yeah. Usually I defer to commissioners, but since it's on the topic of the tubes, I will say that I wasn't thinking when I suggested that we use them that these locations were as far off the beaten path as they are. I think if you're replacing in the same locations, then we probably don't need the tubes. I was really thinking about them as sort of a cue to care, like a, a way of indicating that these are intentional plantings, you know, be careful around them. Don't let your dog pee on it or don't try to rip it out for whatever reason. <laughs> Uh, et cetera. So I think we're probably less in need of it if it's sort of in in the weeds, literally. Well, my, my concern is more rabbits, to tell you the truth. That's fair. Um, you know, trying to protect them for a period of time from getting eaten. Uh, and then, you know, so they get a little bigger, a little tougher, maybe a little less tasty. <laughs> Um, so, so one thought I had on those tubes was it, whether it might be possible to use something like a, uh, this size milk container cut off the bottoms or, or, uh, if it's not, not on the beaten path and people don't worry quite so much about the way it looks, that might be a, a low cost option as well. How many um, plants are you looking at and why wouldn't you consider like wire mesh? you know, small enough that the it could keep the rabbits out tall enough that it, I hate putting plastic in the environment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, these <clears throat> tubes are, yeah, they are, I think they are plastic. Mm -hmm. Um, it partly it, uh, with wire I, mesh, you could wire make, mesh together. make it. Yeah, yeah. And you could have it go down in the soil, have it high enough Obviously, the the you know the holes, the openings have to be smaller than like chicken wire, but you can do that, and then you can take them out when the plant gets bigger, eat more easily. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's just an idea, and I think those can be cheaper. I don't know. David White is is shaking his head, so maybe he knows. David, you have any uh any information on? Oh, David, you're muted. Twitter. David, you're muted. We can't hear you. The wire mesh approach does work for rabbits. Just have to take it off when the plant grows big, but it works. 
Yeah, it, it was. I think it was more time, the amount of time it would take to put them together. It's not easy to cut the wire. Uh, I've done a little bit of my own, and doing twenty-five might uh, might uh, take some time. Hmm. If we had some help, a, a huge amount of help that might, you know, or twenty-five people could make one, that would be fantastic. But <laughs> I don't think I could put together twenty-five. Yeah, so 25. Yeah, it doesn't seem insurmountable to put 25 together, but it would be nice to find a source. I just did a, a search on my uh, iPad, and they everything seems to be pretty expensive. So I, I think that making them yourself is the most economical, and I can imagine. Have you lost a lot of uh, newly planted shrubs in the past? And is that why you're concerned about this area? Um. I just know that the rabbit population is pretty is pretty robust. Rabbits are bad in mm -hmm. Arlington. Um, yeah, very bad. Yeah, and I'm sure that they would love to chow down on small stuff. Okay. Um, well, so I, I um, Elaine, why don't you connect with me offline? Because I have a bunch of neighbors who are interested in you know, kids, you know, high schoolers mm -hmm. who are interested in doing stuff to help out and also for community service and stuff. Mm -hmm. and so we might be yeah, able yeah, to get you great. some help. Yeah, yeah kids I'm aren't that difficult to do. Yeah, yeah. And maybe yeah. David Morgan can can find you some volunteers too. He's got his hand up. Yeah. Hey, David, I see you have your hand up. What, what do you have <laughs> to do to close off this uh, discussion? So we can move on. Um, Elaine, I'm curious what support you need from the commission do you need are are you interested in making a funding request are you looking just for yeah. the labor what um well the funding request yeah I'm, I, I was interested in the funding request it would be a low low cost request uh, for the actual plant material so it's you know a fifty dollar investment probably it was it was it would be um the other possibility of those tubes would, would get more costly. Um, but yeah, help planting and, uh, you know, sort of help getting, getting some volunteers together is sort of, is sort of the, uh, the other part of this request, especially if we're, if we're doing the, the metal, uh, the, the wire. So I'll, I'll get together with Susan on that. Yeah, and I am happy to help out with the volunteer aspect. Um, so, so, like, the Conservation Land Stewardship Fund would be a good fit for the $50 reimbursement for plant material. Um, so I leave that to commissioners to decide upon whether somebody wants to motion for and also just permission to, to put the, the material into uh, the, this resource area. Could we, um, could we maybe extend the request for funds to like $100 just to account for other material you're going to need in terms of the wire and or twist ties and or whatever you're going to, you know, mm. how are you going to make the cages? And that way, if you don't use it, you don't use it, but... Yeah. It seems reasonable to me that there should this this should also be you know a funding request associated with the plant protection. Yeah, I think that the wire material might be more than fifty dollars, but I'm not certain. No, okay. I don't. No? That I don't know. David knows. I don't know. I, I bought one this at the hardware store. It's not that expensive. Are you it's making it? Okay, great. Yeah. If you're making it, you could probably get a lot. 25 for sure you could get for one, you know, whatever that chicken wire is or whatever they call it. There's a special rabbit mesh. Smoke. Yeah. Yeah, so it would be that. It would be some states. Or it seems like you need it, hold it down. A, a mechanism to quickly make these things up. Yes. And turn them into a circle. Yeah. Okay. So right. what I'm hearing is uh, we need uh, kind of a, a two-part vote. One is to fund this project. And I think 
what I'm hearing is the commission wants to fund up to a hundred dollars in plant and supplies. And I would add to that, if there is money left, you return it back into the fund so we can help others. Or if um, you need more, you come with an additional request with the receipts. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be a separate request and we right. get onto the agenda, but right. exactly. If you, if you need, if you need more, we'd have to, uh, we'd have to think about that and make that vote too. And then secondly, we want to give permission to plant in this area. So do I have a commission that would like to make those? I'll make that motion motions? to fund it and to plant. Sure. And I have a second. Second. My guilt is game seconds. Uh, so Brian McBride. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. David White. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. And did I miss anybody? Uh, Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. Thank Thanks, Elaine. Elaine. Thank you. Thank you for all your help you and much. all yeah, that work. All your hard work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Moving right along. David White. Water Bodies Working Group. We're looking at a budget, uh, an updated budget. Okay. The group met last Thursday. Talk about a number of things. The notes are posted on your materials. But the big news is that we requested $120,000 from the FinCom the next fiscal year. And they cut that down to $85,000 the next fiscal year. So we took a look at our, at our budget for that year and cut things down a bit to actually 98,000 in some of our carryover funds. But the details of that basically are 45,000 for Spy Pond, 40,000 for the reservoir, three weeks at the reservoir, six for Hills Pond, five for McLennan, and two in contingency. That comes to a total of 98,000. It's all in, the, all in our notes from last week. Any questions on that? I, I'm wondering if we need a vote on the revised budget. Approved. And if we do, do, you, do you, maybe David or somebody could put up the, those budget numbers you just saw so people understand if they didn't hear everything. Do the David Morgan. Thank you. I don't think it'll be a big issue because the commission already approved the higher budget. So I don't see why they wouldn't approve a lower one. However, you know, it's good to show everybody what. Good to be a yeah, thinking. Thinking. Yeah. Good the broad mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. There we go. So there's the budget revised. And I would change the comments a little. Basically, on the left, on the rightmost column, should be um, responsive rather than proactive. And the reason we can make the budget higher than what FinCom and, and, and three weeks for the reservoir. Three weeks rather than four. Yeah. And and the reason we can make the budget higher than what was approved, you'll see that you see the number is is higher than the eighty five is because we do have some carryover. Uh, funds from a previous year. So it's not like we're going into the, you know. I think the encumbrance also go, goes away, David. Yeah. So this was, sorry, am I muted? No. No. Um, this was added back in by our office manager. So she's just noting the purchase orders that are outstanding. And okay. I thought we took it out. I, I had previously, but that was to release the amount that was uh, tied up for the spy pond contract. And so now this is reflective of 
actually this this is a bit complicated. So this is reflective of the amount at Spy Pond that we're going to spend in the spring, which we had already accounted for here because we recognize that the calendar year is kind of bisected by the fiscal year and that makes for very difficult accounting. So we're we're accounting for half of the season in FY25 and half of the season in FY24. So Jennifer's gone back and added some of that in that we removed. Suffice it to say, there's an amount of double counting now, now happening in this spreadsheet that she added. It takes us negative. That's not good. Yeah, that's why, because we didn't, we didn't approve a negative balance. We did not. Yeah. So I, I would. You adjust that? I don't think that we had 53,000 remaining at the end of the year, though. We didn't. It was much less than that. It was 20-something, no. I thought, or 30-something. I didn't know that Jennifer had edited this. I apologize. I can't. That's know. okay. So I'm concerned that it shows a negative balance. That's not what we want to deliver. It's not what we approve, no. Yeah. Is this something that the uh, Water Bodies Working Group is going to have to work on again? I guess because we didn't commission? see this. We we worked on one that, that did not show a negative week, balance. We were gonna yeah. Clear. yeah. Okay. So we're going to have to work on it again and then we'll do another. I'll clarify book. the carryover. Okay. All right. So uh, with that, moving right along. Uh... I might also mention <clears> that the, um, what the, the people came to Hills Pond yesterday and looked at it. It's a good shape. Water and wetlands. Yeah, yeah, water and wetlands, sure. It was actually 53. Yeah, it was. It this was. That's what we had. Approved. These are from the working groups. Was we approved? So, as I confusingly explained, Jennifer added some figures in there that were double counting what we had already accounted for. This accurately reflects the way that we deal with the calendar year and you know the treatment season, et cetera, spanning to. We have to account for some of it up front and some of it after the fact. And we've done that here. So this is an accurate representation of our budget per fiscal year. This is okay. what we voted on in the water. Yes, that's what we discussed, yeah. So this is what I would propose we vote on here. But I see Sarah has her hand up. I don't know if you see that, Chuck. I absolutely do. I'm just trying to take control of this meeting. Hold on a second there. <laughs> Sarah. I'm going to be really quick and pardon my ignorance. Two questions. Uh, um, does, does these budgets and these needs, are, are they at all covered by CPA funds or are they? Nope. Okay. Yeah, I can answer that. And I think someone already did, but no, they're not. Okay. That's my head. That's too bad. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So do we have a vote? We finished with the discussion. This budget. David Morgan makes a request to uh, for the commission to accept the budget, the water body working White. group. David, David White. White, sorry. Yes. Do I okay. have a second? I second. Second by Susan Chapnick. Uh, Mike Gildas game. Yep. Brian McBride. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. David White. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. All right, great. I hope it all works out and you find more funds when things don't go. Maybe let's I, guess, I guess in the worst, the worst case, this is the worst case scenario on the, on the screen. So if they don't, it's not as bad as we think, there may be a little more funds left over. Um, moving right along on the agenda, we have um, Sarah Alfaro Franco will give us a uh, update from the tree committee, Sarah. This is Sorry. going to be very short uh, because I unfortunately was sick and was not able to uh, make the last three committee meeting. And my apologies. So, but that's quite understandable. So. Uh, well, thank you for uh, letting us know. And 
I'm glad you got better and attended our meeting. So we're going to move right along to CPA update. And that is Brian McBride. Hey, thanks, Chuck. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, do you see a picture of a pond? Yes. Hills, Hills Pond, maybe? Um, great. So uh, I'll just try to do this quickly. Um, not a ton of the CPA projects this year are within our jurisdiction. There, there are a couple that are that touch, but many of them are not. Uh, but I thought the group might be interested in general on the CPA um, process and, and current status. And see, uh, Sue Doctor was on a minute ago. I'm not sure. I can't see any more, but uh, feel free to chime in, Sue, uh, my fellow CPA committee member. I'm um, so. Thanks, Brian. Oh, hey, good. So great, great. So um, I think folks know there are three buckets for the CPA funding, historic preservation, open space, and recreation combined together, and the community housing. And there are requirements by the state that those three buckets uh, each get at least 10% of the total spend. And then the rest of it, the other 70%, is free to spend, but you must spend at least 10% on, on those three buckets. Um, so the, the first bucket I'll, we'll go into is the housing. And so there are four or so housing projects that got funded this year. Um, I should mention that the funding is not final yet, although um, the CPA committee did vote on this budget you'll see here. It still does need to go for to town meeting for approval. I believe they've talked to the select board and, and others, but I think the town meeting is the last step. So there's a, a funding for a, a special needs um, home on Medford Street. That will, that will house people with some, some specialized brain injuries that need special attention. So that was funded at the rate of $200,000. Um, the 10 Sunnyside project, which is 50 or so units um, off Summer Street, um, got $500,000. It's a much bigger project. I think this is the second or third year we've contributed the CPA money toward this project. Um, there are two um, with the Housing Corporation. One is a homeless prevention program, which provides small grants for people who are facing eviction or imminent homelessness, and it tries to keep them on track and prevent that from happening. Um, similar, there's a leasing differential if people aren't getting the full amount of money from HUD to uh, cover um, uh, housing costs. The, the um, uh, program, the Somerville Homeless Coalition, in Arlington, only in Arlington, will chip in a difference to try to close that gap. So there are a couple of gap closure programs that help people stay in their homes. Um, there's a, a project specifically for the repair of the um, Shea House roof, which is in bad shape, which is a Salvation uh, Army project, which houses people in need. Um, yeah, so those are the housing projects that got funded. Um, the next two or three are historic preservation. Um, they funded, the committee funded most of the request to digitize town records. You can see the old tattered um, records that are in, you know, near falling apart. Um, and the town clerk's office, I believe, yeah, town clerk's office requested more like $150,000 to digitize those. They, they only gave them 77 this year, but I, I expect they'll give them more if this proves successful. Um, the continued work on the Robbins uh, Memorial Garden, uh, they'll be doing some planting. They got $115,000 to continue that project, which is coming along really pretty. And then there's the Foot of the Rocks uh, Battlefield uh, uh, Memorial, appropriate for this weekend. Um, they've gotten some hundreds of thousands of dollars over the past couple of years. They were given another $450,000. They're in a rush to try to get this done by the is it 250th anniversary of the project, which looks a little challenging. Um, they also have some pressure to generate private donations. So they weren't given the full amount they originally asked for, but with the understanding they would try to seek private funding to supplement the CPA money. Um, and maybe more, more in our ballpark, uh, David's project for the McLennan uh, Detention Pond Survey was funded at $40,000, so that's good. Um, the public land management uh, addendum, uh, additional work on that plan based on the working group's um, requests for six or seven different items that they would cover, an additional $25,000. The Minuteman bikeway redesign near um, the hockey rink, I tried to improve that intersection and accessibility, got $50,000. Uh, the Crosby Court um, tennis court, 
project uh, we costed more like a million or a million and a half. I can't remember the exact number, but was uh, we came to agreement with the PRC that they would only take 150,000 this year to do a feasibility study to make sure the neighborhood was aligned with the goals of the project first. And then once that was accomplished, the, the bulk of the project would well be funded uh, in a subsequent year. And then finally, the one that we talked about as a group, uh, the Manami Rocks uh, Play Park was funded for $400,000. And that does have uh, wetland um, uh, border issues that we discussed in that meeting, which I'm sure we'll be talking about further. That's it. Um, it came out to be around $2.2 .2 million. And there are some estimates here of the state match and leftover funds. And so it wasn't exactly the amount uh, that was asked for. There may be a little extra. And I think we'll see how things go with those sort of unpredictable sources of revenue from the state and leftover money, but it should be pretty close. Well, that was, yeah, sure. Any questions? Oh, very nice presentation, Brian. I appreciate the effort that you put into these slides and bringing the commission up to date. Well, I do have to confess they're not my slides. <laughs> I hijacked them for another presentation. But uh, yeah, thank you, Chuck. Appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the update. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, moving right along, and if you could take the uh, stop sharing the screen, I think you're working on that. I can see you doing that. Um, <laughs> So uh, our next item on the agenda is the Artificial Turf Study Committee final report discussion. And Mike Killis game is going to bring the commission up to date with the work that the um, yeah, the Artificial Turf Study Committee has been doing. Mike. Thank you, Chuck. Um, as you all remember, last May, uh, the Arlington Town Meeting uh, established the uh, Artificial Turf Study Committee uh, and uh, the committee was made up of nine members, seven of whom are voting members, and two ex officio. I can list those if you want. If not, I'll keep moving along. Um, the uh, committee was uh, set up to review and report on artificial turf, its health, safety, and environmental impacts, and potential mitigation measures, and a comparison of artificial turf to natural turf fields. Um, I should say that the uh, committee uh, was made up of folks of very different perspectives, experience, and interests. Uh, however, for the most part, it was a very respectful and very productive effort by the committee. Uh, we met uh, starting in December for 15 times. Every week, we had a meeting pretty much every week. Uh, with a lot of work being done between those meetings uh, and uh, came up with a, uh, a final committee report uh, April 12th, uh, just uh, last week. So I just wanted to say that uh, in addition to the committee, uh, I got substantial assistance uh, and uh, help from Susan Chapnick in many regards on uh, assessments, uh, language, uh, data and information. So thank you, Susan, for your big input onto this. Um, we formed three subgroups in the committee, one looking at public health issues, one at safety, and one of environmental issues. And that's the way the report is pretty much framed. The only thing that we were not charged with doing yet, we delved into a little bit is cost issues, because we felt that was a key issue. Um, I will point out that from the environmental uh, perspective, and David Morgan, please chime in here with any thoughts you have as a member of that committee. Uh, there were a few areas that I thought could have been a bit stronger on the environmental aspects of the uh, report. Uh, and uh, I'll just briefly mention those. Um, uh, we did find that everyone sort of agreed that artificial turf fields are inconsistent with climate change and resiliency, which uh, was uh, an important issue that we talked about quite a lot. The other talk, the other issue we mentioned and uh, discussed was the issue of recycling artificial turf field components. Uh, and uh, there, the um, fact is that we don't know of any good environmental um, solutions for recycling these fields that need to be recycled every eight or 10 years. Uh, that was an issue of significant discussion. 
Um, I would also point out that we, uh, in terms of the cost issue that I mentioned, uh, it there was no consensus because the de it's so site dependent that it's really hard to come up with a range of costs. Uh, I mean, you can come up with a range, which we did, but it, it's not too meaningful until you get down to the specific site you're dealing with. Uh, and so one of the key points of emphasis that we all agreed on was that this is a very site-specific issue. Uh, you know, is it over an old landfill? Is it in an area that tends to get wet? What's the soil like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was an issue of, of real importance. The other one was field maintenance. Whether you're talking artificial turf or natural turf, maintenance has to be something that is considered in the cost of the initial project. It can't be something that you sort of think about as you go along, because the fact is that maintenance will lengthen the useful life of the field, whether it's natural or artificial. So uh, we did reference the public land management plan in Arlington, which uh, has some input to this. Um, I will go on briefly to the findings and recommendations so we can get to some questions or comments that people may have. And, um, and I think it's, it's important to note that uh, the committee felt that artificial turf should be an option for future field planners in Arlington, but only after careful evaluation of the practicality and feasibility of natural turf options that uh, was the desired uh, outcome. And we felt, and this again was a, a, a good area of agreement that crumb rubber infills should not be used in artificial turf fields in Arlington. That was the consensus. Uh, regarding that, I think it's worth noting that we spent a lot of time on the issue of whether or not the findings and recommendations of this report should apply to Arlington Catholic and to the Arlington High School fields that are well underway in terms of planning development. And I see Jeff is here. Uh, we'll hear more from him a little bit later. But there was uh, some concern that uh, uh, the committee felt that these two fields should be excluded from the findings and recommendations although there was considerable public input uh, and my, I guess my own feeling that uh, these fields, uh, based on the findings that we have, th th these fields should not necessarily go to crumb rubber. Uh, I mean, if this town uh, decision to go with this committee and its findings and recommendations, and then to ignore one of the key findings and recommendations, Moving forward, uh, there was some real discussion about whether that was fair or not. The committee strongly felt, and uh, with a minor dissent, that uh, it was the implicit intent of the town to exclude these two uh, fields from uh, the recommendations against crumb rubber and the other things we were talking about. So that was one area of, of concern that did come up. But I would also mention that um, the committee wanted to really emphasize that all future field development projects in Arlington should be evaluated, as I mentioned, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, because those individual site-specific characteristics really can uh, make a big difference in, uh, in what happens. So David Morgan, I don't know if you want to add anything to any of that. I think you summarized it really well. I will point out that Natasha Wayden and Jim Batulio did the facilitation for this and deserve all the credit in the world for moving a lot of perspectives and a lot of individuals through 15 meetings in record time to make a deadline for town meeting. So, yeah, uh, I think, thank you, David. That's really important to point out. I, I have sat on lots of boards and committees, and I've never seen a set of uh, minutes uh, to the quality that Natasha has put together and uh, the draft report incorporating comments from a lot of people was a lot of work and they spent a lot of extra time on it. So yeah, I agree with you, David. Thank you.
Now I take any questions or comments people may have. Sure, let's open it up for a question and comments. First from the commission. Ah, uh, Susan. Um, thanks, Mike. That was a great summary. And and I would like to thank Mike, um, David as well, but David was on paternity leave for a lot of this, but <laughs> he kind of chimed in at the end. But Mike um, really, really uh, led the environmental subgroup, which consisted of him as well as um, David Morgan when David was there. And um, who else Joe was Clark. on there, Mike? Joe, this right. Far from capital planning. From capital planning. And and Mike really kind of kept them all um, moving along. Um, <clears throat> I would like to say, I, I'm, I'm pleased with the depth and the breadth of what was reviewed during the study. I'm impressed that they did as much as they did. They also had outside experts come in and talk to the commission um, besides references. They prioritized references that were peer-reviewed science, um, government um, entities um, over industry, which I also applaud. Um, I, I will say I'm a little disappointed, as Mike said, in um, the strength of some of the, the concluding statements. So if you read the entire report, I'm, I'm pleased with how it came out, but the concluding statements make it sound like these that artificial turf fields could be cited based on the needs of the town and can be mitigated for human health and environmental impacts. And I strongly disagree that you could mitigate environmental impacts of these fields in terms of wildlife habitat, in terms of impact to aquatic organisms, in terms of heat, in terms of um, climate impacts such as loss of carbon sequestration, use of fossil fuels, no meaningful recycling of sustainability issues and plastic proliferation, as well as particulates coming off the fields and affecting organisms. So I feel very strongly that they could have left off the environmental piece and say, yeah, we can make, we understand because I think it's said in the rest of the report, we understand that there are environmental impacts. We as a town might make a choice to put these fields in any way due to other priorities. I really wish they would have said it that way. So that's my comment. Okay. Uh, yeah. Are there any more comments? Any comments from... Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Brian McRide. I saw that in the last uh, minute. Uh, this may be kind of an ignorant question due to my newness in this board, but so the study group uh, by the town is, I guess, a political uh, decision-making process, right, to decide the direction for artificial turf. I'm trying to get straight in my head how that overlaps with our mission under the Wildlands Protection Acts which I think is more limited and more specific to designated pollutants getting into special designated uh, wetlands, right? So I, I guess there's the, like a Venn diagram of sorts where there's this bigger political question about, you know, it could be injuries, it could be expense, it could be many reasons for not wanting uh, artificial turf in the town and, and the town can decide that, I assume. Am I correct in, in this thinking that our, our mission as a conservation commission is more limited to pollutants leaving these fields and entering a wetland. Um, we have I, we have eight interests of the act we have to uphold under the Wetlands Protection Act and a few extra ones under our bylaw. And you are totally right. If if a project of artificial turf field is proposed in a resource area, in one of our jurisdictional areas, then it comes to the Conservation Commission. And we need to apply, we need to uphold those interests of the act and those values. And that has to do with not just pollution. There are other, you know, there's habitat, yeah. you know, th there are other things as well, flooding, stormwater, um, you know. Um, I would point you at, point you to it's a it's a long report, but there are a few um, tables in the report, and one of the tables is a wetlands table that um, the environmental subgroup put together to kind of point out what some of the value wetland values are 
and um, the impact of an artificial turf field on that value and whether that could be mitigated. But okay. you are totally right. It doesn't matter what the town says as their approach. If it's in a wetland resource area, it comes to the Conservation Commission. I don't know if you wanted to add to that, Chuck, if I said that correctly. Yeah, sure. I would only go turn to the regulations and say that the regulations have a threshold and that's alter. If there's something that's going to be altered that is within the jurisdictional area, then it's the responsibility of the Conservation Commission to condition it to, no, so you can start out by approving a project, you can condition a project, um, and you can deny a project if you need to do that to be compliant with the regulations. So if the artificial turf has altered or could possibly alter possible i don't know if i want to say possible but if it has altered it's measurable and we can you know put a pen in it then it needs a condition or if it can't be helped we need to deny that project so i think my i read the report and i thought it was pretty good i was very happy with the committee i thought that you know, it was a group that I thought would go out for many beers together. They seem <laughs> to have a good time working with each other, and they did a lot of work in a short amount of time. But um, in my mind, it really didn't answer the environmental question. I I had a lot more uh, questions at the end of reading that than I did when I when I first got it. So um, I don't know. Maybe I'm too strict. So anyways, that's that's all I'll say. Um, Brian, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's super helpful. And I think I, hopefully some members of the audience might have the same uh, question about the, the jurisdiction and the role of this committee and, and that kind of answer may help them as well. So thanks very much to both of you. Okay, so if anyone else uh, would like to chime in on that, use the raise hand functions at the bottom of the screen or use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen and press the raise hand tab and Chuck, we'll get I to just, you. I just add one more thing and that sure. is that there were over a hundred references cited in this report. Uh, and I think the intent, as I think Susan mentioned earlier, is to get peer reviewed studies uh, or other authoritative studies rather than uh, from folks or organizations which have a sort of an ax to grind. So uh, it was a real attempt. And I, as I said, this committee had a great range of views, perspectives, and experience, but we all worked together respectfully, I think, for the most yes. part, came up with a good response. That was very clear to anyone who watched these uh, these meetings. And thank you, Mike, for taking the time. It was a lot of work. I don't mm -hmm. know if you knew what you were getting into when you <laughs> said yes, but you did a great job. Thank you. Um, there's a question at, to put a link to the report in the chat. It's also on the um, on our agenda materials. If anybody mm -hmm. goes to the CONCOM agenda, it's, it's in the materials as well. Yep. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, anyone who's uh, attend attending tonight's meeting would like to say something about this report? Otherwise, we're going to move on. And seeing none, uh, our next item on the agenda is a request for an amendment to DEP file number 91323, which is the order of conditions we issued to the Arlington High School at 869 Massachusetts Avenue. And I know that Jeff Thielman's here for that. And if you look into our regulations, you'll see that the project uh, at section 18 of our regulations uh, that we just approved, it talks about permit amendments. And it says that the applicant shall request orally or in writing uh, to the commission and describe the changes that they want to make. But the commission has some choices and they can only approve an amendment if it's um, minor in nature. So if the commission feels like it's not minor in nature, then it has to be a notice of intent. But what we wanna do here tonight is we have this 
regulation that we first have to agree that this request is an amendment and not uh, not a new notice of intent. And I'll just go through the items that uh, we're supposed to think about as, as uh, we're discussing this. And so the purpose of the project has not changed. The scope of the project has not increased. The project still meets the relevant standards of the regulations, the resource area is still protected and the potential for adverse impacts to the resource area values will not uh, will not be, and I didn't grab the last app, but it will not be altered. So what, with that, I think that we did talk about this a lot at our last meeting and Jeff brought up, um, I'm just gonna just summarize this and I'm gonna see if Jeff wants to add something because I think it would be fair to have Jeff summarize the changes that he wants the commission to think about. So we talked about the field and we talked about the concern about the runoff and how that was going to be handled. And the fact that inside that runoff, there's a there's a lot of things, but we mostly talked about six, six PPD queen on and how that could be handled. And this group is proposing to basically insert a cartridge into the existing approved uh, treatment train that will filter out a lot of particulates. And then I guess it goes into the um, detention basin and in certain storms, it wouldn't infiltrate into the ground, but it would hit that maximum level that would be held and it would overflow into Millbrook. I hope I get that right. But uh, with that, I'm gonna bring Jeff on to, to pick up on anything that I missed, but the amendment would be to include this piece and maintenance that would make sure that those cartridges are replaced as the manufacturer has uh, has put out in their literature. So Jeff, please uh, take over from this point. Just just introduce yourself for the for the record, please. Uh, yeah, my name is Jeff Thielman, T H I E L M E N. I'm the chair of the Arlington High School Building Committee. I think you summarized it, Chuck. I don't have anything to add. There was a letter that went to the commission uh, from Steve Garvin, our consultant, that kind of sum that summarized everything that we have there. Okay. And with that, I'd like to see if the commission has any questions. I see Mike Gildas game has his hand up. Mike, please. Uh... Yes, uh, Chuck, you were referring to a cartridge that would go into that uh, that pipe. And I wanted to clarify from Jeff, is that really a pipe or is it a cartridge or what it's is a, that structure? It's a, it's a basket. A basket, so it's really not a cartridge. No, it's a basket, yeah. Fine mesh basket, is that what it is? Yeah, it's in the it's in all the materials that Steve Garvin right. sent. Yeah, just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, and I think my my point, yeah, basket is more accurate, but it is an insert into the existing, right. you know, stormwater structure that you have already uh, gone through this commission and have permitted for the site. Correct. Thank you, David. There's the list of the uh, proposal it's from Steve, who I see has just joined. A minute to read through that. And while we're doing that, is there anyone else? Did we have like this to some questions? Did we have this before and I missed it? Yeah, it was on the last meeting. Oh, I didn't see item two. I didn't see the summary. I guess I missed it. I think it was. The, the, these are materials that we sent to you on the 17th. On so the 17th. Idea, okay. Right, we're okay. Asking, mm -hmm. we're asking, Thank you. We, had, Thank you. We, we, were, we were, the request as we understand it, understood it was to submit this by the 17th and then ask for a continuance to May 2nd. That's right. Fine. No, that's that's fine. I didn't get to read this today okay. is the 18th and I didn't get to review this yet. So sorry about that. But that's OK. I, we didn't need to review because we're not voting on the amendment, mm -hmm. voting on whether the change is minor enough that we can do this process. And this right. is information that 
Thank you. So I think uh, when, my, when I think of minor, uh, other people chime in, but that's why I described it as inserting a cartridge, which is, we found out is a basket into the existing treatment train um, that's been approved already. So it sounds like there's no expansion of excavation, no additional alteration. This is just and you know a, a different filter mechanism. Uh, this is how it's being proposed. If we decide to uh, accept this as an amendment, we could ask many more questions and get right into uh, you know plans and details and see that if this in fact this information that we've heard orally is true. But um, for me, I'm not sure. David, can you take this down? Um, I don't see a lot of hands up, and if if there are no further questions, I would ask if I if I could have a motion for this uh, request. Uh, motion to, um, I guess, allow. So the so vote would be allow, allow this to continue as an amendment. So so the vote would be that the change is minor. And uh, uh, filing a notice of intent is not needed, so therefore it is a amended order of conditions. I, I just I got that from the regulations, but um, that's tip basically what we want to say. So it's minor in nature, and filing a notice of intent is not needed, so therefore we approve this moving forward as an amended order of conditions. Second. I have a first and a second. Can I get, uh, yep, got my papers. Sorry about this, guys. Um, Susan Chapnick. Yes. David uh, David White. Yes. Mike Gildesgame. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Chuck Taroni says yes. Did I get everyone? David Kaplan says yes. David Kaplan, thank you. OK. This is an amended order of conditions. With that, you would need to go through the uh, notification process. David, do we have enough time to do the notification for this? Uh, for the May 2nd get, meeting. Yeah. For the May 2nd meeting? Yep, already placed. Oh, great. <laughs> That's fortunate. Yeah. And we have the materials as of yesterday, Jeff yep. Thielman told us. So we're all Jeff, set. you're really getting to know our process. I uh, mm. think if you if they ever boot you off the uh, school committee, you got a place here, man. Okay. Well, okay. I'll keep okay. it in mind. <laughs> keep it in mind. Okay. Okay. So this, uh, let's um, keep moving with our agenda. That was pretty Thank good. Thanks, we sir. got through that real quickly. And the next thing on our agenda is uh, the hearing. So the hearing for... The same order, DEP file number 91323, an extension of the order of conditions uh, for the high school, uh, the Arlington High School at 869 Massachusetts Avenue. And the applicant has requested that uh, this hearing be continued until May 2nd. Can I get a motion? That moved. A second. Second. David, uh, Brian McBride. That's a tie. Go for it. Uh, I'm going with, no, I was actually calling, asking for a vote, Brian, but uh, oh, if you want. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. But who got so, the second, Chuck? I think it was David Kaplan and Mike Gillis game. Okay. Uh, I, I moved. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gill this game. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. And Chuck, I have a, a, a question about procedure. So um, for the amendment, that's a hearing. Mm -hmm. We didn't, we didn't, did we set a date? We said May 2nd? Okay. I think so it's already in the paper. On and... that. That's just a hearing that's going to be scheduled for May 2nd as the first hearing, because that's an amendment which is different from the request for an extension. So we're going to have two hearings for the high school on May 2nd. I'm just asking procedure. Yes, we're going to have two okay. votes on May 2nd 
And it would seem to me that we would take the amendment on first and then move to the extension. Thank you. So that's how it will be in the, um, and these will be two separate hearings and um, that's how we'll proceed. Thank you. Okay, Jeff, you're finished quickly tonight. I'm sure Thank we'll you. have a lot more to ask you on the second, but uh, enjoy your night and we're gonna Thank move you. on with our agenda. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Next on the agenda is 88 Coolidge. And so I'll start, I'll start that off. Mary Trudeau's here. Just hold on a second, Mary. So it's been a long time. So we're going to start by doing the, uh, uh, reading the, uh, the, uh, it's called the, uh, the the legal ad. There you go. DEP file number ninety one two seven eight amended amendment to the order of conditions for eighty eight Coolidge, which has been continued a lot, but we're finally here tonight. And the amendment to the order of conditions for eighty eight Coolidge is a public hearing. We'll consider uh, peer review report and amendment to the order of conditions for construction of a new house at eighty eight Coolidge Road in the buffer zone to a bordering vegetated wetland. Mary, I'm, can you introduce yourself for the record and then bring the commission up to date with all of the activity that's happened since uh, we last spoke? Okay, uh, for the record, my name is Mary Trudeau and I'm representing the applicant, um, Jonathan Nyberg, on his request for an amendment to the order of conditions for the 88 Coolidge Road property. Um, as you recall, this came about as the result of an enforcement action that um, there was a violation of the order of conditions, particularly there was some damage done to ledge and your original order of conditions had precluded um, any impacts to ledge having happened on the site. This was problematic because when we went for a building permit, um, the building inspector said that a house such as this with the gradient that it had needs to be pinned to ledge. So that was a conflict with your order of conditions. And his reason was safety and code oriented. Um, so what we did was we filed for a request for an amendment to the order that would allow us to construct a foundation that was in compliance with the state building code. And we entered this rabbit hole with you. We um, came up with a design for a foundation that would require the removal of a small amount of weathered ledge from the lowest outcrop on, within the footprint of the foundation oh. and designed an elaborate um, mitigation system for both overland runoff and any groundwater flows that might be intercepted by the foundation. At this point, the commission sent it out for a third party review to Nobis, who is your consultant. And we started um, again, an endless dialogue back and forth about the design that we had uh, proposed. We're now on our fourth iteration of comments and I submitted to your files today and I'm not sure whether you would have had time to see them two pieces of correspondence. One is dated February 19th, 2024. And this is um, a document that I think may have been given to Nobis at one point, um, but it addresses the letter that we had going back and forth with all the different colored comments on it. I, in this version, I took out any issues that had been resolved through earlier commentary and just left the outstanding um, issues. And I think my comments were in red this, this time. And then I gave you a second letter today that has an erroneous date on it. It's dated August 3rd, 2023. I don't know why I used that date because that is nowhere near today's date, which is what it should be. Should have been dated April 18th, 2024. Um, in any case, this letter addresses the most recent comments back from Nobis, which were their comments on the mounding analysis that we ended up submitting. And the reason we submitted the mounding analysis was that some of the questions in the letter that you have that's dated February 19th 
really required that type of analysis to give you a concrete answer that we had answered them initially to know was by saying we think our system is done is designed correctly and these will won't be an issue but that wasn't really a finite answer so we submitted a mounding um, analysis that was done by Matt Hodge of Hodge with Water Resources. And Nobis came back with another series of um, comments, which they noted as being qualitative comments. Um, and they were interesting in several ways. The first was that they effusively complimented Matt Hodge on his little study that he had done. But then they went on to say that they didn't think that the study was particularly um, suitable for use on a single family house lot, which was always our contention, but there is no better strategy out there, that this is the only way that we knew to answer these questions. And Novus agreed that if you're going to try and answer these questions on a single family house lot, this is probably the way to start. Um, as a result of the Novus review, Novus suggested to the commission that you make three, one of three or three of three or two of three of the comments that they gave to you, parts of the order of conditions. Um, and I, I'll just, I'm not gonna read my entire letter to you, but I'm just gonna read these three points. The first thing that Nobis suggested to the commission was asking or requiring the applicant to provide photographs of the area downhill from the infiltration site, but on the property following rain events for a number of months after the system is constructed and functioning. Um, we have no problem with this condition at all. The second point that they made was asking or requiring the applicant to install a shallow piezometer or well point a few feet downhill from the infiltration site with a screen depth at about the same depth as the infiltration system and using the piezometer to monitor water levels and provide results to the town. Again, we have no problem doing this. It's a very simple installation and it can be read by anyone. Um, the third comment that they made was inviting the town or third party inspections after the infiltration structure is functioning, especially after heavy rain events. Again, uh, we will be doing weekly monitoring on this project as part of the original order of conditions and have no objection to providing documentation to the commission or allowing the commission or its agent to come out and um, make sure that there is no breakout, which seems to be the concern that Nobis had on this issue. Um, the rest of the comments from Nobis were um, interesting, but they were, did not impact the design that we had proposed. They were questions asking for clarification on a ground order elevation, to put an el elevation number on a graph. Um, and we've responded to these comments in this letter as well. And, and, and you can, you know, read it at your leisure and we can talk about it at some point. Um, so at this point, I'm hoping that you will take these two pieces of documentation that I've given you this week. I will send you a copy with a revised date on the erroneous letter and either review them internally as a commission or submit them to Nobis, you know, as a final response. I'm not sure that Nobis, um, is expecting a response. They seem to be saying these were just details that they had commented on in their review. But in any case, we would love it if that could happen in the next two weeks and that we could come back at your May 2nd meeting and hopefully wrap up this review. Hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. That was that was a lot of detail. I, I know that this has gone on a, a long time, but uh, I've heard you speak before and I knew you were going to um, fill the commission in, you know, well. So any uh, any comments from the commission, any uh, concerns, anything that we need to ask the applicant uh, between meetings um, would be great. It would be a great time to do this because, you know, as they say, this has been a while. And I'm Susan. Here. Thank you, Chuck. Um, so, Mary, the the letter um, that's that has lots of different colors on it of different responses from February nineteenth, twenty twenty four, which you summarized a bit. Um, I found that very useful. I didn't get. I only got to skim the one you sent today, 
But um, this one I did have a question about, and and maybe I just missed it. Um, but it has the um, it has a, a site plan with a yes. bunch a bunch of red questions from Nobis. Where are the answers to all those specific questions on the site plan? I think that the changes were made to the site plan in response to them. That was an Al Gala um, response, and he didn't take their questions off after he made the comments. So this February 19th submittal that we have that has red comments on it, and it says, like, is there an overflow for the system? What's the capacity? It doesn't seem like there's an answer to that. Okay, let me check with Al Gala and, and get you a response on that. It was my understanding that he had addressed those, but it may be that... Um... Or maybe some of them are addressed in one of the letters. And, and frankly, I lost track. I was trying to follow yeah. everything. I mean, um, I do know that the systems have overflows um, that are set... At, you know specific elevations but i'm not the engineer i'm not really the one to give you that decisive answer right so i guess my my overall question is are all those red boxes with questions on them on the site plan from the 219 2024 dated submittal answered and where are the answers so that's my first question okay okay and then my second one is, are we going to have an engineer um, at the, the May 2nd meeting to ask questions? So, for example, if I had a question about, well, the mounting analysis looks to be 4.8 feet and the bottom of the infiltration system is at, you know, whatever feet. And I'm concerned that they're right on top of each other. And he can tell me, no, you're wrong, Susan, you're misinterpreting it or you're not. I need somebody to answer those questions for me that I don't. I, I can have me. anyone at the meeting that you would like. Al Gala okay. is in Portugal right now. So he is not here tonight, but I think he will be back by that date. So I could ask that he and perhaps Matt Hodges okay. attend the meeting. That would be helpful because if we yeah. have questions as commissioners and somebody can't answer them, then it gets continued again. Okay. Thank you, Mary. I think that's very reasonable. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? Seeing, seeing none, I just want to let Mary know that we are we don't have any more funds for our peer reviewer. So I, before you mentioned that you wanted to continue into the next meeting just to, to finish this off, I just thought one, two, and three, pictures, pisometer, and uh, monitoring um, the infiltration area after rain events could be conditions that we would add to this amendment. Absolutely. Um, and if they were conditions, what would happen if they're not met? Like, let's say we did find, you know, monitoring is one thing. What if I you monitor we, it and you find there's a problem? What What is the solution? Well, I think the solution would be, and this is not something that we expect, back to happen because we feel the system is oversized and Nobis agreed with our findings on how much water would be accumulated. But I think the step would be that the commission would again, either issue a friendly enforcement action asking mm -hmm. us to redesign or modify the system. Um, or we would come in with a request for an amendment to do that. Right. I, I think it's, on that particular issue, I think it's unlikely, but I would assume that would be the procedure. And and let's not forget, this is not a septic system. This is a rainwater right. system. And if it breaks out, it's rainwater. Yeah. And it's also, um, this. it's a very interesting. I've been out on this site in some torrential rain events. And I was out on one, I think it was last Friday uh, or maybe the Friday before, and it was absolutely pouring, and there was no seepage at all coming from beneath the roadway bedding that the gradient seems to carry the water past this property. And because we have the berm, the bituminous berm along the frontage, water doesn't come onto our site. So the only water that we seem to be handling is what drops onto us as rain rainfall. I did notice that on the adjacent property to the north, I believe, a one house downhill, 
their curb had broken and the roadway runoff was being directed onto that lot and had actually carved a fairly significant channel during the storm event. And I'm not sure whether that was a new condition. It was certainly the first time I've seen it. Um, but it seems like most of the water in that particular part of the watershed is being carried on top of pavement rather than infiltrating and breaking out through the roadway bedding. I have never seen water come out of the roadway bedding. The only moisture that I have seen along one of the property lines is the um, abutter at the top of the hill where he has that failing retaining wall. Sometimes I notice a little seepage coming through that wall. Um, but you know, it's, it's on the order of a gallon of water in a storm event like that. Not, it's not even a trickle. It's just, I can feel that there's moisture at that point in the wall. So, um, Mary, the, the infiltration system and the rainwater that we're just talking about, there is an updated plan and that plan is stamped by an, uh, by an engineer. Is that correct? Yes. I believe it's Al Gala's plan and yeah. I will make sure that if it has not been stamped appropriately with a revised date that you will have that before. Okay. And can somebody, well, I guess either you or, or David Morgan identify that for the commission because I yeah had trouble I finding it. Thank I you. know it's, it's getting the, the amount of um, information and comments is mind boggling at this point to me. Sure. Okay. Um, I did want to turn to anyone attending tonight's meeting, but Susan, I'm going to make a request that you reach out to David and David send Susan's requests for Al Gala directly, because I just want to make sure there's enough time to answer those that, that you have. I don't see that anyone else on the commission has any questions and I'll come back to the commission, but I want to know if anyone attending tonight's meeting has any questions on this uh, application. And again, you can use the uh, reaction buttons, hit the raise hands functions, or just turn on your uh, video and uh, introduce yourself. Seeing none, I have a question for the commission um, that's here. It by By not having any questions, I'm wondering if that means that we're we're pretty much done with our thought process we have all the information we have we're ready to make a decision and that's where we're going to be at the next hearing outside of some unanswered question that susan might have and david you turned off uh, you yep no, anyway, I, it seemed I, like you had something to say yeah sorry. no I, I agree with that assessment i think we've reviewed a lot of information it sounds like our peer reviewers are um are happy with the information that they've been given and they don't mm -hmm. have any outstanding issues. So I think yeah. we'd be um, in a position to, to vote at the next meeting. I think, I think I we're, think we I... wore them down. I think yeah. we wore them out. They're just tired. So if I'm understanding you, Chuck, you would like, because I, I did not verbally um, ask all my questions. I have a list um, because there is no engineer here. So it would be futile. So you, well, you want can... me to write those to well, David Morgan so he can forward them to the applicant prior to the May 2nd meeting. Please. That okay. Is so helpful. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm assuming all those need to be answered for you to make a decision. Yes. Okay. So yes, that's what I want you to do. Okay. Sounds and, good. And uh, I think that where I'm at with this is uh, I know that when this came back, we stopped everybody in their tracks because all of a sudden we're now pinning the foundation to the bedrock and and we're not even on that question anymore we're we're on a question about <laughs> infiltration and right. break, but, breakout but would, and mounting yeah. but i would remind everyone that we have four conditions in the original order of conditions about not removing bedrock not touching bedrock not pinning to bedrock and the, uh, all the reasons were had to do with groundwater flow and flood flooding so there were good reasons that we put those conditions in there. I would remind commissioners to look at those conditions. They're 39 to 45. Just to get an idea what our thought process was, I understand that the building inspector said, you can't do this. It's a shame we didn't know that back then. So we could have had this whole discussion then. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But I think commissioners, because there are several who weren't around when this was permitted in 2017, should read that original order of conditions and just understand what our concerns were. And then go to the current information. Are our concerns being addressed? Our concerns about why we didn't want to touch the bedrock. So, so the amendment is only for what the applicant applicant has asked for. We cannot redo the old order of conditions. No, I didn't say redo, so, but they're no, asking for gonna... change to those conditions. Yeah, That's what so, they're asking for. So read it for your information, right. but but understand, you know how how we got here and if all these questions have been answered and i guess what mary said about you know you know what if if there's going to be some sort of breakout if the infiltration chamber isn't large enough and the capacity exceeds or the the volume exceeds the capacity we're going to have some problems what would happen that could be an enforcement order that could be compliance by the applicant because who wants that in their backyard of a brand new house? You know, all, all these things need to be considered. So I agree. I think that we should be ready for a vote at the next meeting. I see that, you know, most of the commissioners here feels the same way. So I don't, I don't know if you can continually ask questions between now and then, but I implore you, Susan, to get your questions onto a piece of paper or on an email, get them to David. So, Al Gala can can give a response and have some time to uh, think about those responses. I would also say that Nathaniel Stevens, who has been through this entire process as well, wanted to, he's not here tonight. He did want to listen to the recording and do, use the Mullen rule to be um, eligible to vote on this. And I'm not sure if he has any questions and he's coming back Monday. So just... Okay, so hopefully you can just get like to, yeah. just like to throw in there, Chuck, and I know I'm making you crazy, is that Susan is exactly right, that those conditions that were imposed by the commission concerned the ability of groundwater to move from point A through point B and not be impacted by the foundation, which is exactly why we've designed this system. So our hope is that we have addressed those concerns through the design of this very expensive perimeter drain underground filtration system. Um, and that's where we'll start our discussion next week. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I, uh, so Mary, you go, you're asking for us to continue this to uh, May, May, 2nd. May 2nd, right? Please, sure. yes. Continue to May 2nd. Second. A second? Second. Okay, so um, David White. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yep. David Kaplan. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you on the second. Okay, see you later. Bye bye. All right. So I see a lot of people left in our uh, attending tonight's meeting. Does anyone have any questions for the commission before we adjourn our meeting? Just use the raise hand function and we can take your questions. Seeing none, kind of a motion to adjourn at 8.59. Woo, really? a minute you... before nine. Wow, That's... I'm impressed. Oh, <laughs> so moved. A second? A second. Let's just wave again. Everyone wave and we're that's a unanimous wave. And no, thank you, everyone. Uh we'll see you at the next meeting. Bye now. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.